From the nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. Today's topic, President versus Congress. Does the separation of powers still work? Nearly 200 years ago, our founding fathers in the Federalist argued that the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. The preservation of liberty requires that the three great departments of power should be separate. The underlying argument elsewhere in the Federalist Papers states the great security consists in giving to those who administer each department the necessary constitutional means and personal motives to resist encroachments of the others. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Then nearly a hundred years ago, the Federalist concept was hotly challenged and by one who would later be President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. Wilson denouncing the almost absolute power of the standing committees of the Congress and the overriding discipline of an external authority, the political party to which the majority of the Congress owed allegiance, called for cabinet government. He defined cabinet government as simply to give to the heads of the executive departments, the members of the cabinet, seats in the Congress with the privilege of the initiative in legislation. Thus, in essence, was launched the debate in modern times on reform of our system of government toward the British parliamentary system, modifications of which are general in Western Europe and, yes, in Japan. And the turmoil and frustrations of these past years both in the domestic and foreign affairs areas and urgent demands for more effective and efficient government have renewed debate on the question, does the separation of powers still work? To lead us through this labyrinth, we have a highly expert panel. To my far right, Mr. Henry O. Brandon, foreign correspondent, war correspondent, diplomatic correspondent, and now bureau chief and associate editor in Washington of the Sunday Times of London. To my immediate right, Mr. Lloyd N. Cutler, a distinguished Washington attorney with broad experience on government and academic boards and commissions, capped by service in the White House as counsel to President Carter. To my immediate left, Mr. Lawrence Silberman, also a distinguished Washington attorney, former Deputy Attorney General of the United States, former ambassador to Yugoslavia, former Under Secretary of Labor and Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Mr. Silberman is presently an Executive Vice President of the Crocker National Bank in San Francisco. To my far left, Dr. James Q. Wilson, a member of AEI's Council of Academic Advisors, former Director of the Joint Center for Urban Studies of MIT and Harvard, and Harvard's Henry Lee Shattuck Professor of Government. Well, to begin, gentlemen, I would pose the same question to each of you. Is our 200-year-old separation of powers tradition an anachronism, obsolete in the technology and mass and speed of communications in modern society? Mr. Cutler. John, I believe it is an anachronism and one in need of some revision. Along with uh, then Professor, then later President Wilson, I believe we do need to do a better job of forming a government in the parliamentary sense that can legislate and execute a balanced program for governing and that with every succeeding administration this need is becoming more acute. I also believe that the fault is not personal to any president or legislature, legislator, but that the structure of our Constitution and in particular the rigid separation between the legislative and the executive branches prevents us from doing significantly better. And I think, and I've been urging, that it's time for all of us to start pondering and debating in forums like this one about whether and how to correct this structural fault. Ambassador Silberman? 
Well, I'm afraid I disagree. Uh, I'm inclined to believe today, as people believed uh, 200 years ago, that the separation of powers doctrine is an enormously important protection for American citizens. That is to say, that the separation of powers between the three branches of government makes it very difficult for the government to accrue power. And I think it is desi as desirable today as it was 200 years ago to make it difficult for the government to accrue power, because that is, after all, the potential or one potential threat to the well-being of citizens. All right, Mr. Brandon. I want to make it clear from the start that uh, I do not mean to propose the imposition of the British monarchy or the British parliamentary system here. Uh, I am in favor of uh, reforms of the present American political system. Uh, it is a system that is today the oldest and the least changed in the world. The office held today by the American president is far more like that held by President Washington than that held by Queen Elizabeth II resembles uh, that held by George III. The United States today is the, w is the leader of the free world. And as such, it has to undertake some very major and important commitments. And if the president cannot be sure that he can uh, adhere to those commitments, it becomes very difficult for the United States to be recognized as a world leader. Dr. Wilson. To paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill, I think the separation of powers is a poor philosophy of government, save in comparison to all others. It has its defects. Those will probably come out in our discussion, perhaps notably with respect to the conduct of foreign affairs. But it has the virtues of those defects as well. It facilitates scrutiny uh, at the expense sometimes of action. It protects the particular and the individual, sometimes at the expense of the general. But it has brought about the capacity to engage in great national commitments when important national emergencies arose. And it has, above all, permitted a union to be created out of great diversity by providing separate constitutional places on which individuals could focus their loyalties. Right, Mr. Cutler, your article in Foreign Affairs in the closing months of 1980, entitled To Form a Government, has brought debate on the separation of powers to center stage. You wrote particularly of the separation of powers between the legislative and executive branches, and you said the separation of powers between these two branches, whatever its merits in 1793, has become a structure that almost guarantees stalemate today. Now, in a very broad brush, you suggested that uh, we should have candidates for president, vice president, and Congress run as a team in all election districts, uh, require a uh, half of the cabinet to be or allowed to be members of the Congress, establish a six-year term for the president, the vice president, the members of the Senate and the House, establish procedures for the president or Congress to be able to call for general elections when stalemate sets in for the remainder of the current terms, this election process to take no more than 120 days. My argument really has two basic points to it. Let me say first that I did not advocate any of those constitutional revisions that you enumerated. I simply tabulated them as ideas that had come to the fore. My central proposition is that we need to study and appreciate more than we have the costs of the separation of powers between the legislature and the executive that need to be weighed alongside its admitted benefits. My central thesis is that at least in 1980 and in the decades ahead, if not at some earlier time, we need to have in this country a balanced program for governing rather than a hodgepodge program for governing. By that I mean that government has any number of important social and economic goals, uh, controlling inflation, 
providing jobs, increasing productivity, ensuring uh, social justice and social welfare, providing for our national defense, uh, accepting Americans ro America's role today as the guardian of the entire free world, protecting the environment, that not all of those goals can be pursued in full vigor at the same time, even in a country as rich as this one, and that the art of governing has become striking the proper balance among the goals and coming forward with a balanced program presented to the electorate on the basis of which elected officials are elected and can then proceed to legislate if necessary and then execute that balanced program. My thesis is that today it is impossible for the elected president or the elected majority in either house or both houses of Congress to legislate and e execute a balanced program. We have no way, given <clears throat> the structure of the presidency and the Congress and the many things that have happened to our party system, the growth of single interest political groupings, the uh, well-meant reforms of Congress, no way in which the resulting policies adopted are a balanced set of policies which anyone elected will endorse. The president does not endorse the package that emerges. It's not his program. It is not the program of a legislative majority. It is a series of individual ad hoc majorities, each pursuing its own policy on each particular issue as it arises. And as a result, when failure comes, when the effort to pursue these various policies uh, gets out of balance, we have no one to hold accountable. The president cannot fairly be blamed because his program has not been adopted. The majority of Congress or the minority cannot fairly be blamed. They don't have any particular program of their own, and the majority differs from one measure to another. And that that is a basic problem of American government, not shared by the parliamentary governments, including those with written constitutions, many of which we helped to write in the post-war era, era ourselves, notably the constitutions of Germany and Japan. It may be that some of the deficiencies that have resulted, that is the lack of power in anyone, any group of elected officials, to enact a balanced program and execute it, could be cured by non-constitutional measures. But they are structural problems which every president elected in this century has had to endure, and which every president, with the possible exception of FDR, uh, in the face of two great national crises that helped to bring us together, has been unable to solve. All right, you have put a large uh, agenda on the table. Ambassador Silvermoon, you'd, you'd like to uh, Yes, I would, rebut. John. Actually, uh, given one axiom or one hypothesis, I would agree with Lloyd entirely. If we could reach behind there and pull down those books and find the balanced program that we could all agree upon, he would be absolutely right. Uh, <clears throat> but in fact, there is no such thing as a balanced program. There is one program, another program, other person's program. In Lloyd's article, he uses it as an example of an excellent piece of legislation, indeed a treaty, the SALT Treaty, in which all people would recognize it was balanced. Well, in fact, there was a substantial, perhaps majority, certainly significant minority in this country, that thought it was awful. And in fact, thought the president behaved imprudently in negotiating that since he had been signaled at the very outset by the selection of his arms control uh, negotiator and the 40 senators who voted against the confirmation that he was going to have a very difficult time getting the SALT treaty that he wished to negotiate 
through the Senate. In fact, he had, had he been more prudent, he might have come up with a different treaty and might have gotten it through. But you can't take the proposition and accept it that what President Carter thought was balanced, that is to say, which worked out of a bureaucratic clash between various executive branch agencies, was somehow superior in any way to that which would come out either in legislation or treaties or whatever out of the process of the executive proposing and the Congress compromising and legislating. In other words, in short, there is no magic to Lloyd's assertion that there is some magic kind of balanced program which will come forth from a, an executive, a president, if you just leave him alone. Dr. Wilson? As I read Mr. Cutler and as I listen to him, I, I think he has a philosophy of governance that was at odds with that, that the framers of the Constitution embodied in that document. Good policy, good government is, I think to Mr. Cutler, the product or the act of a single will. It is an act of management, of allocation, of balance. Uh, the framers, I think, thought differently, that uh, good policy could be recognized when it appeared, but to achieve it in the real world required that in the process of ambition, counteracting ambition, uh, coalitions would have to be formed, coalitions out of partially self-interested groups, and they helped that the Constitution would lead these coalitions to emerge uh, only on the principle of the common good. This has not always happened, but it is a first approximation of their effort. I think it is intellectually unlikely that given the difficulty and magnitude of our problems, admittedly great, but I suspect no greater than the problems other presidents in past centuries have had to deal with, that intellectually we can devise a program that corresponds to a theory of governance based on an act of will or intelligence. And I think politically it's unlikely that we can devise institutions which could translate that will, if formulated, into uh, a desirable effect. If we consider Great Britain with res due respect to Mr. Brandon, uh, I do not see that great the steady hand, that even philosophy of governance, that, that striking for balances that emerges from the parliamentary system. They have nationalized and denationalized interest industry at a dizzying rate. They have perhaps the worst labor management relations of any Western democracy. Uh, they have had extraordinary difficulties in deciding whether they're going to be part of the European community or not part of the European community. I have profound sympathies with their difficulties because I think we would have as many. But it does not suggest that once you put in place the appropriate parliamentary devices, that there is a will which, when revealed, will produce altogether good effects. Brandon. I want to, uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, take issue with my colleague George Will, who uh, uh, seemed to have blamed uh, President Carter for these uh, difficult uh, uh, constitutional difficulties. Uh, it's, it's often also said that the, the problems that have arisen uh, are all due to uh, the aftermath of Vietnam and Watergate. I'll, uh, as a little uh, practical example, in 1962, uh, President Kennedy uh, asked Congress for a tax cut. And for months, he labored to get that tax cut. And he couldn't get it. And it happened that uh, I saw Prime Minister Macmillan at the time in London. And he said to me, you mean to say that if the American president wants a tax cut, he can't get a tax cut? I said, yes, that's the case. He said, you know, if I need a tax cut, I can get it within a month. Now, if a president has decided that it is the right thing for this country to have a tax cut, and he can't get a tax cut, how on earth can he do the best for his country? How will Mr. Reagan uh, be able to uh, govern if he p finds himself in a very similar position. I don't know whether he will get his tax cut or not. But you can't tell me whether he is going to get that tax cut. So it is very difficult for any government in this country to plan ahead. You want a long-term policy that stretches maybe over two, three, or four years, particularly in the economic field. 
And if you cannot say that I would like to accomplish in two years this or that, how on earth can a president govern? Well, Ambassador Silverman, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, despite election year invective, Dwight Eisenhower, Lyndon Johnson, all managed to work effectively with Congress under varying conditions. And there's no intent here tonight to focus on, on President Carter, because we're really talking about the problems of the presidency in the, in the issue of uh, separation of powers. But is it possible that policy failure and stalemate, as we have known it and identified it in our times, to a high degree depends on the incumbent in the White House? Well, of, of course. Uh, I hesitated to uh, take up Lloyd's uh, example of President Carter's uh, uh, governance, for want of a better word, over the last four years because the election is over and we shouldn't be partisan anymore. But since George Will is being attacked for suggesting that a good part of uh, President Carter's problems were brought upon himself, I must confess I totally agree with that. Uh, and I think I, I think the reason for that is right, that. I just hope we can have a repeat of this program three and a half years from now. You, you've, got oh, you've got a guarantee. You've got a guarantee. And incidentally, President Reagan's proposal for a tax cut is a balanced program. <laughs> uh, we'll, you'll accept that, won't you? Uh, I'm. I would like to see President Reagan and the elected majority, and unfortunately there isn't one, have the opportunity to carry out the Reagan program, so the Republican platform program. President Carter uh, governed very much out of the philosophy, it seems to me, of Lloyd Cutler's article. He took each problem by itself, sort of as an ad hoc engineering problem, and thought there was a, quote, right solution, or to use uh, Lloyd's word, a balanced solution. And he would work on it and arrive at it and spring that forth to the Congress and then wait with astonishment when the Congress either rejected it, chewed it up by amendment, or ignored it. Well, the fact is that we want something more out of a president than the intellectual will or the individual who can promulgate messages. We want a savvy politician who can form consensus and who also comes to the presidency with some kind of coherent notion of what he wants to do with the presidency. And after all, that is only what he has, is the presidency. And I would submit to you that if anyone goes back and looks at Jimmy Carter's campaign promises, despite some of the uh, allusion, allusions in Lloyd Cutler's article, you'll find it very difficult to find that coherent program. That is to say, I think he came to office without a clear idea about doing anything except reorganizing the government, moving boxes around, and theoretically creating less agencies, and he ended up creating more. And as a result, since he had no coherent idea of what he wanted to do, and he disdained the political process, which is the process by which you build consensus, it was inevitable that he would fail. And finding uh, solace in the structure of the Constitution seems to me whistling in the dark. Well, if, if we're going to get political as a veteran, of an administration of one president who was unable to complete his term, the only one who resigned in history, and another president who was unable to win an election. I'm surprised, Larry, that you would make remarks of that kind. The issue is an issue of whether anyone's program or any majority's program can be adopted. Is there anyone you know of during the Ford administration or the Nixon administration, who was ready to say the programs that were followed during my administration are programs I totally endorse. And I submit to you, you will not find that. President Ford, over and over again, was ready to criticize that Democratic Congress, which did not allow him to carry out his programs. One of the oddest things, but one I think that helps to prove my point, is that we not only have a system in which the presidency and the white and the congress majority in the congress have been held by opposite parties for half of the last seven administrations and we're now about to enter an eighth but that even when they are held by the same party it doesn't seem to make any difference 
the opponents of SALT II, if you want to bring that up, had no balanced program of their own for governing. They might have had a way to go about arms control and an arms race in the way that they thought was best, but they had no solution as to how that was to be balanced with the other problems of the budget and unemployment and social justice and social security. No one is prepared to endorse the outcome of what our combined melange of legislators and president come up with. Essentially, it's to go back, as I mentioned in my article to old Joe Jacobs, the fight manager, it's every man for their self. As a recent AEI book urged in its last chapter, when we speak of how the president ought to be able to manage the government, there isn't any government down there to manage. There are a series of sub-governments pursuing single interests of one kind or another, and a new majority has to be formed on every single issue. I'd like to come back to Jim Wilson's point, of, if I could, that my thesis is at odds with the framers. I would agree with that because the framers did not want the government or a government to exist that could manage our lives and manage all the problems that we face in the world. If you believe that government should do the very least possible, not only in domestic affairs but in foreign affairs as well, the framers had a very good system for doing that. I'd also like to point out, Jim, I'm not speaking of the act of a single will. I am not urging more power for the president and less power for the Congress. What I am urging is that the president and the majority, the elected majority in the Congress, in one way or another, have to be made to share the same political fate and take a joint responsibility for forming a balanced program, carrying it out, and living or dying politically by the results. That's the central thesis. And how to go to accomplish that, I admit, is a very, very difficult proposition. But without it, I submit stalemate and a continued melange of policies that no elected official is prepared to endorse because he always had a better program and he should not be held accountable for the result is an unsatisfactory method of governing ourselves in this century, especially with the need we have to react promptly to new events and crises all over the world which are no longer within the reach of American military power. Dr. Wilson. You see, Lloyd, though I grant some force to your argument with respect to the conduct of foreign affairs, I don't think that in general it corresponds to what the American people expect. They do not wish to have an opportunity to vote yes or no on a party's cohesive performance in office in which it takes responsibility for the policies that have been put in place because the American public does not exist as a public. It is a collection of separate publics that, is dis that has discovered, I think, or would readily admit if it were pointed out to them, that if they have to vote yes or no on a comprehensive set of policies, they can't. They are torn with too many internal contradictions. I think they would par far prefer, and over the last 200 years have more or less successfully modified policies by taking up the various constitutional opportunities presented to them. Off-term elections for the House, uh, six-year terms for the Senate, presidential elections, the congressional oversight process, the lobbying process, uh, campaign contributions as a way of giving expression to particular preferences which I admit the unlucky folk in Washington must cope with and try to put together uh, into a coalition around that issue. Uh, this creates great difficulties for those who govern. So great dif uh, difficulty that many persons have traditionally, especially those associated with activist presidents, regularly published books about the deadlock of democracy. Whenever the deadlock is broken, however, as they allege it has been in recent years, they bring out a new title of a book. It's called The Imperial Presidency. And that doesn't seem to be desirable either. Uh, I happen to agree with the notion that the imperial presidency is a mistake, but I don't think we've had an imperial presidency with perhaps a few exceptions. I think the deadlock of democracy is not a deadlock at all, that it produced in the 30s and in the 60s and in the 70s an extraordinary outpouring of legislative innovation 
because there was a sufficient coherence to certain ideas to permit change to occur. But the people are unwilling to simply vote yes or no in a national referendum about the record of a party because the people are too various. They wish these diverse opportunities to peck and chip and constrain in order to moderate policy. My view is that if you take American policy and compare it to that of most parliamentary democracies, its leading characteristic is its moderation. Uh, there are many policies I don't approve of and regularly call immoderate. But taken as a whole, uh, we tend to temper the enthusiasm of temporary majorities by the need to constantly reformulate that majority. But let's go on to something that everybody in this audience would agree on, and that's the budget. If there is any critical element to running a government or running an economy, it is a budget. We are the only democracy in the world that I know of in which the legislature is able to enact a, an aggregate budget and appropriations greater than proposed by the leader of the government. We have a budget consistently with a higher deficit than the president wants, than the majority leaders want, than every member of Congress wants, because we cannot get together on a single budget. The result of the melange of interests that Jim and Larry have described make us essentially ungovernable. We cannot have a budget. The central feature of modern government and running a modern economy today for which either the elected president or any, any of the 535 elected members of the Congress, Senate and House, will take responsibility. They all wanted a lower budget with more for their programs and less for somebody else's programs that would be more balanced, but they couldn't get it, and nobody is at fault. I say to you, that is not a government, and that is not a responsible way of conducting ourselves in this latter half of the 20th century. Mr. Brand? I think you, it comes down to the, <clears throat> to the simple fact that there has to be someone who can de define and determine the national interest. And uh, a body like Congress, in its today's uh, composition, I'm now not talking about 100 years ago, cannot do that. It cannot formulate, for instance, a foreign policy. It cannot formulate a budget. So you have to have someone you trust. And after all, the president is elected by the people. And the president has a vast a variety of uh, counselors. And you have to assume that he can make mistakes. But. Uh, maybe his mistakes in the end are less uh, perilous than having no policy or having a policy uh, as uh, Lloyd uh, calls it uh, of a hodgepodge. Dr. Wilson? I wish we wouldn't agree so readily that America has a foreign policy that is a hodgepodge. I disagree with many elements of it and certain tendencies of it, but we're speaking now of a country uh, that won uh, the Second World War, that put in place European reconstruction, that rearmed the West, that created the NATO alliance, that gave aid to Greece and Turkey, that established a ring of alliances that gave some hope to democratic regimes in all parts of the world, uh, that fought communist interventionism when it was not in our material interest to do so. And though we have surely made mistakes in the pursuit of all of these objectives, I really don't think that's such a bad policy. And if you ask, would a stronger president have a better one? I ask, did General de Gaulle have a better policy when he was president of France? It was certainly all the power he could have wished for. With respect to the, to the budget, I agree that the, the, the budget cycle that, that Lloyd accurately describes proves conclusively that there is a difference between the public interest and the summation of private wants, something that my colleagues in political science like to deny, but this fact, I believe, establishes it. The question is, how do we deal with that? And I'm not sure it's by having a stronger president who can say, this is my budget, take it or leave it. Uh, president Johnson did this in, during the Vietnam War uh, and decided to print money to finance a deficit. Uh, it seems to me perhaps we have to have a sharper restriction. And per, though we have not mentioned it so, so far, 
if constitutional revision is to occur, perhaps we should consider those forms of revision that place a limitation uh, linked to gross national product on public expenditures. Well, I believe we have broadly presented the, the subject and also the issues that are concerned in it. Time for the question and answer session. May I have the first question, please? Sir. Mr. Cutler, I'm Mel Alpha of Newsweek magazine. Uh, under your system, you suggested that when the uh, president and the Congress reached a stalemate, they would necessarily have to resign and new, have new elections. How would that contribute to the efficiency of government and speed in dealing with foreign policy issues? Uh, don't we necessarily, uh, wouldn't that put us on the road to a kind of fourth republic? Mel, I didn't suggest that uh, any of the proposals that are listed. I simply tried to catalog them. Uh, the uh, present French Constitution, as you may know, empowers the president to call for new elections in the parliament, not the other way around. Uh, one possibility that has been brooded about is a possible two-way street, one in which the president would have to take the initiative. If he exercised a constitutional power to dissolve the Congress and call for new elections, a majority or perhaps two-thirds of the con Congress only in that event could call for a new presidential election at the same time. That power is sort of an ultimate nuclear weapon kind of power, admittedly. But its existence might break many stalemates because of the distaste of the members of Congress for having a new election. That's, that's the theory of it. And of course, it could only work if we had an electoral system, and we would have to adopt it as part of any such change, which could produce a new government as in Britain or in the constitutional uh, parliamentary systems within 30 to 60 days. Dr. With the incumbent uh, government staying in until, until the election had been once held. Once you start right. unraveling right. the sweater, uh, it all starts coming apart. You mm -hmm. cannot change one part of the system without as Mr. Cutler has indicated, thinking about changing all parts of the system. If we have the president calling an election or the Congress forcing a presidential election, we have to change the party system, which means we have to change the degree of control of the national government over state governments, because ultimately they control the local party systems. Uh, we have to force a different kind of primary or convention system. This alters the relationship between uh, the state governments and the parties. Uh, I cannot, because I lack the wit, imagine all of the additional permutations that are implied. My point is simple. There are no simple changes in the Constitution. Well, also, Mr. Cutler, doesn't it work in a system where a, the party is unified over principle, where uh, there are smaller constituencies and more unified homogeneous countries? Uh, in our country of 220 million people and so many diverse political interests, uh, our political parties uh, really couldn't sit down and subscribe to a single body of values. Look at the fighting that goes on over a, uh, something like a political platform in a uh, convention. It is the least lowest common denominator. It would be hard to uh, find a, a group of congressmen and a president of either political party who could sit down and agree on a balanced program. It would be exceedingly hard and, and I, therefore I think it would lead to uh, incredible instability. For any of these various measures, uh, the whole point of it is to induce the kind of shared political fate between legislators, a majority of legislators as a group, and the president that would lead them to agree on a balanced program. If we are going to accept the proposition that we're so diverse we can't agree, agree on a balanced program and therefore we can't have one, well, I really fear for what's going to happen to this country. If we can't have a balanced program, we can't control our budget. I would take the My, position, excuse me. Uh, well, let me just ahead. say one more thing. My main thesis, though, Mel, is not to advance any one of these solutions. I agree every one of these solutions has a lot of problems to it. My main thesis is to try to establish the proposition that we need to do better in forming a government, as I describe it, that we don't do it today that structural problems stand in the way, particularly the lack of a shared political fate between the legislators and the, and the president or the candidate for president, and Ambassador. that that's what we need to focus on. Ambassador Silverman? Well, I would simply mention very briefly uh, and reiterate the point 
that I don't think we could define a balanced program. I think that's a very uh, illusory word. It suggests uh, some kind of objective standard, and there is not. Uh, Lloyd's balanced program would be an anathema to me. And but to Larry, go back... Larry, that's the whole point. To go back to Henry's point, I don't think we can trust anybody to define the national interest, even the president, except me. Uh, <laughs> But it is and not, I don't think I'll, you'll give me that constitutional It's not problem. a question of whether Program A is better than Program B, whether more defense and less social welfare is better than the other way around, whether we ought to lower taxes to increase productivity or, or have the federal government do something. It's that somebody's program is given a chance. What we have today is nobody's program. No one is prepared to endorse what we have today, and I will wager you anything that Governor, uh, Governor Reagan, President-elect Reagan, will not be able to carry out his program, however he chooses to define it, and he will say, you can't blame me, and the Congress will do the same thing. Brandon? I only want to add that Mr. Elfin uh, defined the reasons why I think the, the British parliamentary system could not be applied in this country at the, the diversity of our society. Yeah. yeah. All right, next question, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Walter Burns, American Enterprise Institute. Uh, Mr. Cutler, I'm afraid I have to ask you a question, too. It seems to me that you exaggerate the difficulties that the president faces, uh, both in, in foreign policy and in domestic policy. And by that, of course, I mean that he faces difficulties that are part of the uh, system of separated powers and that these difficulties really prevent him from doing what has to be done at any particular time. Uh, could it fairly be said that it was the separation of powers that prevented uh, President Carter from responding properly at the time when the hostages were seized? Mr. Cutler. Uh, I don't think in the case of the hostage crisis which united this country, in which Congress probably would have done anything that the President asked, that the separation of powers was a factor. I disagree with your conclusions that the president adopted the wrong policies. I haven't heard any other policies put forward either before or after the fact that had much of a chance of achieving any different result than what we now have. But I'll give you some other examples. I'll give you the invasion of Afghanistan and the need, number one, uh, or at least the perceived need by the president, to provide some additional aid to Pakistan, where we ran into the problems of legislative requirements that neither military nor various some types of economic aid could be given to Pakistan unless Pakistan had given certain non-proliferation assurances, which could not uh, be obtained, uh, or the case of draft registration in which when the president, the head of our government in foreign policy, determined that one appropriate signal to the Soviets was that at the very least we were going to prepare for the possible need for a draft, the difficulty of obtaining draft registration approval even for a $20 million appropriation, that's all, was at, all that was at stake, took so long and all, as to blunt the message we were trying to send and proved almost insurmountable. Your first response, I think, is interesting. Uh, that's to say, the, your response to my first point about uh, the seizure of the hostages. You said, if I can uh, recall exactly, that on that particular occasion, it was certainly not the separation of powers that prevented the president from doing what might be done because there was such a unanimity of view in the country and uh, that, uh, that any policy that made sense probably would have... Uh, Even some that didn't make sense. And probably some that wouldn't make, make sense, yes. Guns. Now, it strikes me that that is exactly the sort of thing that Mr. Wilson was talking about uh, uh, earlier, uh, that when indeed that kind of un unanimity behind a particular policy is understood to be, uh, or, or is present, and when there is that kind of agreement in the country, that a particular problem has to be dealt with and so forth, the separation of powers is not an insuperable barrier to the achievement of, of policy. That's and entirely right. And therefore, I, I conclude 
by uh, repeating what I said at the beginning. In my opinion, you exaggerate the difficulties posed well, by the I, separation of powers. I tried powers. not to. I tried to point out in my article that when the system has worked, when we have been able to legislate and execute a policy for dealing with a situation, the Great Depression and FDR's second experience, World War II, uh, the early days of the Johnson Great Society, uh, perhaps the early days of Wilson's uh, own New Frontier, that when there is a great consensus in the country, usually brought on by a great crisis, an external shock, the assassination of a beloved president, whatever it might be, for a while the system works. But those are very rare times in this century. And when we think of when the system worked, when we think of great presidents who accomplished something in their administrations, we tend to think of Wilson, FDR, perhaps Lyndon Johnson, and perhaps Ike, who governed successfully for eight years by running the most limited possible government. Uh, Ike, I think you can throw out because his theory was to do as little as possible, and while it worked in 1952, uh, I at least don't think it works in the world we live in today, where we, our own uh, economy now, is such an integral part of a worldwide system over which, mo over most of which, uh, the writ of our Constitution and our government just doesn't run at all. I don't think it is possible any longer to let our little free enterprise system, unmanaged, flower in a world of managed and competing world economies. I may be wrong about that, and I don't want to debate that. We must, you want to talk to this yes, point? Yes, I would just respond to uh, Lloyd Cutler's last remark. It seems to me uh, his comment about the Eisenhower administration reflects what is the underlying reality of his thesis. It is posed in terms of a procedural reform. But in fact, it's based on certain subjective notions of what are proper policy. And if you read his article, it's quite clear. He goes through and explains all the things that the Carter administration couldn't get done, which he thinks should have been done. And then he describes them as balanced. And then he says, since we couldn't do that, there is a fundamental defect in American government, and it has to be our Constitution. And it seems to me it's very difficult, reading his article or hearing him tonight, to think of any neutral question that somehow can be described outside of a subjective policy view. Now, earlier when I talked about one man's balanced program as another man's extreme program, he made his second point, which is, well, put that aside. Still, at least, there ought to be a political accountability, and everybody ought to have to stand together under a single program, Congress, Senate, President. Well, as a matter of fact, we had an election in the latter part of 1980 in which a great deal more of that than many thought was likely or possible showed out to be true, that a number of senators were turned out of office, as well as the president, for voting for and adopting certain policies which the majority of the American people thought were wrong. Let us get on to another question with no objection. Next question, please. Yes, I'm Ruth Heinerfeld of the League of Women Voters. I would like to pursue this question of a national consensus. As Dr. Wilson said, the public interest is not necessarily the sum of private interests. And as Mr. Cutler has pointed out, national consensuses only seem to emerge in times of great national adversity. Uh, what institutional uh, improvements or changes can there be short of the kind of changes advocated by Mr. Cutler that would help the nation in its search for consensus. Since you were first mentioned, would you start, Dr. Wilson? I'm not confident there are institutional strategies to achieve that objective. Uh, I think among the reasons why there is not only dissensus, but in some quarters uh, disaffection about the government, is that the government has promised more than it could achieve and has done so at the expense of inflating the currency uh, and harming in a very visible way a, a style of life that most Americans thought was their birthright. Uh, 
I am not convinced, and this is the source of my ultimate skepticism about Mr. Cutler's proposal, that, that institutional reforms of the sort he proposes would do anything more than feed this process by enlarging expectations, enlarging the role of the president as a national leader, uh, conducting a, not an election, but a plebiscite, in which his proposals would be put forward and based on assembling a coalition out of by offering as much as possible to as many as possible. And that though this would sound good in the short run, it would lead to these enlarged and then ultimately frustrated expectations. Well, I, I agree with Jim Wilson as to what wise policy is for the federal government. I also would like to see it be more, mo more modest and much more forthright in recognizing that we can't have energy self-sufficiency and a perfect environment and a productive industry all at one and the same time. But my, my difficulty with what he suggests is that it is going to be very difficult for a president elected on a mandate of having government be more moderate to carry out that policy. And we need a way, and I think in the end the public is going to look for the party that is going to say, we do intend to discipline ourselves. Uh, if you elect us to office, both the presidency and the legislature, we are going to stick together and carry out this program. And if the majority whip goes against the leadership and the president on a particular matter, he's going to lose his office of whip, something we don't do today in our system. Anybody else wish to talk to this question? Next question, please. Herbert, yes, Dr. Stein. Stein. Herbert Stein, American Enterprise Institute. There is a question which I did not hear discussed, and that has to do with the change in the kind of thing that government does, which has affected the balance of power between the executive and the legislative branch in a very fundamental way, and that is this enormous explosion of government regulation, which the Congress has no possible way of exercising any control over, and which uh, has uh, inevitably made an enormous shift of power towards the executive. And I wonder whether anybody has any suggestions well, I, for ways of redressing that imbalance. I would move right over with you and Larry on that proposition. Yes. I've proposed myself that the president should assert power over the executive branch regulatory agencies and even that the Congress give him power over the independent agencies. Um, but uh, once more, to, to be able to do any of these things, you need the discipline uh, as between the, even an executive so disposed and the majority in the Congress to accomplish it. Because as you know, every congressional, every uh, regulatory agency has, uh, even with its single mission, has behind it a single mission congressional committee and single mission constituencies. And it's very hard even for a determined president to impose the need for balance and considering other national goals on that agency. Dr. Wilson? Uh, I uh, am ordinarily not cast in the role of a reformer, but if reforms are to be sought, I think we should seek them from within the American experience on the basis of those institutional arrangements with which the American people have become accustomed. That We should not reach overseas to, for approximations of the parliamentary system, but we should look at state and city government in this country and ask what modifications in federal arrangements already tested at the city and state level might commend themselves. Many governors have, in fact, line item vetoes awarded to them by state constitutions. Uh, many city charters deny to city councils the right to increase the executive budget. Uh, none of them, so far as I know, allow the, president, the governor or the or mayor to force a new election or vice versa, uh, nor do they require the abolition of the separation of powers. These more modest changes, which would require, as Mr. Cutler says, uh, constitutional change, are the sorts of ones on which I think we could focus attention with a greater confidence that we knew what we were getting as a result. I think, I think that's an excellent point. but. One thing, since we have uh, I certainly indicated a disagreement between Lloyd Cutler and myself, I would say, apropos of his last remark, that in his article at one point he does advocate that the president have control of the executive branch agencies, and I know he has previously described that in, more, in a more elaborate way, and I thoroughly agree with the notion that the independent regulatory agencies is 
a constitutional anomaly, uh, and uh, in many in a constitutional anomaly because it is. Uh, in many respects in defiance of democratic theory because these independent agencies are not responsive to any democratic process, not to the Congress, not to the President. I would go so further on that, and here Lloyd probably wouldn't agree with me, to suggest as I did earlier that many of our problems, including many of the frustrations of the executive, come about because of the avowed and open judicial policy making, which was not contemplated by the founders of the Constitution. I knew I'd lose you on that. Return to this thing. Let yeah. me cite Paul McAvoy, yeah. Herb's colleague or one of his successors, as an example for the proposition that more new regulatory agencies, and from the present cost-imposing standpoint, some of the those with the greatest impact, were created during the Republican, Nixon, and Ford administrations than during the uh, Kennedy, Johnson, and Carter administrations combined. Now, I hasten to say, as you would say, that, that most of that was done because there were Democratic Congresses during those administrations. But I submit to you that proves my point. We had not formed a government capable of carrying out a policy during those administrations. That's where an EPA originated by a Nixon executive order. That's when OSHA originated. That's when the Consumer Product Safety Commission originated. They are all children of this bastard form of government we have in which the president might go one way and the legislature, or parts of it, were free to go another and would and did. All right, this concludes another public policy forum presented by the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. On behalf of AEI, our hearty thanks to the distinguished and expert panelists, Mr. Henry O. Brandon, Mr. Lloyd N. Cutler, Ambassador Lawrence Silberman, and Dr. James Q. Wilson. It is the aim of AEI to clarify issues of the day by presenting many viewpoints in the hope that by doing so, those who wish to learn about the decision-making process will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. This public policy forum series is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C. AEI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, publicly supported research and education organization. Information on this and other subject areas, including government regulation, economic policy, social security and retirement, health policy, legal policy, tax policy, political and social processes, energy policy, defense policy, and international affairs is available from the Institute. For a transcript of this program, send $3.75 to the American Enterprise Institute, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036.